you were involved directly or indirectly with some of the greats of Australian distance running, uh, Rob D. Costello, uh, Lisa Martin on decky, Andrew Lloyd, who could ever forget Andrew Lloyd at the Brisbane Commonwealth Games in the 5,000 metres, uh, Michael Shelley, and there's just a, a whole list of uh, people who won medals at various levels and uh, were, were competitive on the world scene. If we talk too much about your coaching career, we actually overlook your running career, which I find extraordinary in the context that you probably didn't take it up until you were close to 40 or just gone past 40, but uh, you, you became uh, an international athlete yourself in the, in the veterans or the masters, running from 800 metres up to the marathon, and you ran actually 227, which would have put you well into Olympic Games contention uh, back in those days, uh, and probably still today. What's your memory of your athletic career, Dick? Again, I mentioned, Lee, that you know, I never applied for a coaching job. Uh, I never applied, you know, I got tapped on the shoulder for the footy and uh, with the cricket, I talked about that. Uh, and the same with, with running. Now I was pretty busy as head of physiology and sports science there for quite a while at the Institute of Sport. So when a runner came to me, uh, all distraught that she'd lost a scholarship and wanted me to coach her, my immediate reaction was, no, sorry, I, I can't do that. I, I, I just haven't got the time. But this young lady was so distraught that I just couldn't, I couldn't say no. And so I said, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll look after you. If you want to stay in Canberra, you don't want to go back to, to Melbourne and you haven't got a scholarship, how are you going to live? We worked all that out. <laughs> Within a year uh, of me looking after her, when I didn't do very much, I could tell you that right now, it was, you know, getting out, having a run with her and things like that. Um, having a chat to her, making sure, you know, trying to make as, as, as sure as we could that she wasn't going to get hurt and, uh, and sick. Uh, within a year, she'd broken the Australian record and made the Olympic Games team. So I thought, well, this is, this is the easiest gig I've had in my life, you know. I've hardly done anything and here we've got a champion that, you know, that came out of losing a scholarship. Uh, so uh, that, that um, led to a number of other people asking if I could look after them. And you mentioned a few of them there, like um, Lisa Martin at the time, who became Lisa Rondiki, and Andrew Lloyd. I was already getting good experience as Rob DiCostello's physiologist and nutritionist. You know, really good experience. Uh, Rob DiCostello was the first person I ever employed at the Institute of Sport. And I went down to his place and spoke to his mum and dad and that uh, over at Q uh, in Melbourne. Uh, and uh, uh, he just finished a biophysics degree, or was finishing a biophysics degree at Swinburne Institute of Technology. And uh, I thought, this guy is the first person I'm going to get up in Canberra, for sure. And uh, I gave him an offer he couldn't refuse, like about 15,000 bucks a year. <laughs> and it really was nothing at the time. And uh, no, he just wanted to come. And uh, he, um, he wasn't a scholarship holder, but he worked with me in the lab. And I, I got him because I knew he'd be able to talk to the athletes really well when, when the athletes got picked up there. Um, and uh, within a year and a half after that, two years, he, he became world champion. Mm. Uh, so he left my little job at the Institute of Sport in the lab there. And uh, he spent his summers in uh, Canberra and the other in, and the, 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 the Australian winter he spent over in Boulder, Colorado in their summer. Uh, but just to be involved with Rob DiCostello and his coach at the time, Pat Lahesse, who was down in Melbourne for quite a bit of the first time when I employed Rob up there and then came to Canberra later on, uh, that was a great experience because I got to know about, you know, what runners, how runners think and how runners train and those sort of things were very valuable experiences, Lee. Um, and you clearly had some talent because you finished in the World Masters Games third in the 1500, I think, from memory. Oh, yeah, that's right. I was, yeah, you asked me about my running. I'd forgotten about that. Um, I, I don't think much about my running, to be, to be honest. I know I, I, I start, I, I'd started earlier than what you said. I'd started around... Um, when I was looking after the Victorian cricket team, like the guys like Max Walker and, uh, you know, <laughs> and the other guys, they used, to, they used to laugh at me because... Some, I always used to think, if I can't help the team, um, 
what am I supposed to be doing? You know? And uh, there were a couple of times, I remember once over in Adelaide, where it was a really, really close game. And I used to get pretty uptight about a close game, particularly when I was just sitting there watching the damn game. You know? and so what I do when it was really close, it might be five o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, and it was really tense, I'd sneak out and go for a run along the torrents. And, and I'd do that because there was no way known that me sitting there was going to help anybody. And all it was doing is putting me under stress. So the way I was going to get rid of that stress was go for a run. But every time I did that, and I don't think I told uh, uh, Tangles or any of the other guys too much about it, but every time I did that, went out for, say, 20 or 30 minute jog, whenever I'd come back, we'd be on top again. <laughs> <laughs> so it became a bit of a superstition. So when it got tight, I try and find an opportunity, whether it's at the MCG or over in Wacker or whatever, to have a bit of a, a bit of a run. And at nine times out of ten, I reckon, or it might have been five times out of six, I did it. We 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 turned the tables in the half an hour. I'd been away, <laughs> so I, that's where I started to run. And I sort of found that you know, being a light sort of a person, I was always felt a light you know, frame footballer and so on, that I could could run and 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 run pretty well over the uh, middle and the longer distances. So that's when I bumped into you one time when you know, out the back of Park Orchards there in, in, um, in Doncaster, uh, where I was, I would have been training for my first marathon or perhaps possibly second or third. Uh, and the first marathon was in, in 1978. And- uh, Oh, the big end. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I mean, I've got a lot of stories about that. You probably don't want to hear them now, but one, st one, one story, that I'll never ever forget. I'm pretty sure it was that. If it wasn't that one, it was one soon after. Um, where I was standing on the start line and everybody was looking at me. And I thought, that's funny, they're all looking at me and, and laughing. <laughs> but it wasn't me they were looking at. It was the guy that was standing next to me who had a, a, a Dunlop um, shoes on uh, with a little green stripe on them, I think they had then, and those the Dunlop shoes. <laughs> with a pinstripe suit on and a, and a shirt, but he didn't have a tie on. And, and everyone said, oh, good on you, mate. Where are you going? Now, I couldn't believe it, but after 5K, around 4 to 5K, he was running alongside me. Now, I was trying to run three hours for that first marathon. So I thought three hours would be pretty good if I could get on three, three hours. And uh, so he was running about three-hour pace for that first 5K. I turn over to him, turn around to him, and he's still still there. I said, "Are you serious?" <laughs> he said, "What do you mean?" Because uh, he, he would have been 55, 60. Yeah. I said, "You going to run all the way up to the GPO in Melbourne, 26 or 20, you know, 35 k away at that stage?" I said, "Of course I am." And, and, and people at the side are clapping him, and yeah. and I said, "Well, what what makes you so confident?" He said, oh, well, I know I can do it. I said, well, is it your first marathon? He said, yeah, but well, how do you know you can do it? He said, well, my mate was supposed to drop me off from, um, from uh, Melbourne where I was staying down at Frankston this morning. The bugger didn't turn up. So I had to run down last night and I made it easy. So I know I'm going to be able to get back. <laughs> and of course, that was uh, Cliffy Young. Cliffy Young. And he went yeah. on to become a bit of a legend. And uh, yeah. later on, as it yeah. turned out, I ended up testing him in the lab at the Institute of Sport just for for a television channel, we're on a bit of promotion stuff. So, so that was, you know, I'll never forget Cliffy Young, just a terrific fellow too. Dick, it would be remiss if we didn't talk about your footy career because you hold a unique piece in uh, Preston history. You also coached the footy club uh, for two years after having played there for about four years, two premierships, won the uh, JJ Liston Trophy. Um, and we have, uh, I have a vision of you getting out of your cricket uh, gear at training to s into your footy gear to start uh, the pre-season training uh, down at Preston. Great years for you. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a real honour, really, to be able to be out there at uh, pre-season uh, football training. And in those days, you're it. You know, if you're the coach of the Preston Football Club, you don't have a phys ed bloke to take the training. You have one assistant coach who had to look after the seconds, and that's it. So you do everything. You you got you you, um, you take training. You organise all the tactics. You involved in the selection right at the top and so on. 
So, and that was the same with the cricket as well. But that was just usual because we weren't particularly professional. We certainly weren't doing anything at that stage. Well, I wasn't for the money, that's for sure. There wasn't a lot around and, and it wasn't expected. At that particular time, we had pre-season training at Cranor Street in the footy. And that was I'd arranged at the start, I, I can't remember, 6.30 or whatever, 7 o'clock. And but we had we were preparing for the finals in the in the cricket. So there was there was no other way to do it. I just wanted there wasn't the time. So I, I I brought my footy gear out to, to the middle of the ground, plonked it there, went to cricket practice with all the change, and then changed from my uh, cricket whites to the my my footy gear. Um, so I could take the pre-season footy train out in the middle of the ground. <laughs> so I had the two, at this one stage, I, I was coaching two groups at the one time, the, you know, the Preston Footy Club and the Preston Cricket Club, simultaneously, <laughs> if you call it coaching, I don't know what they call it coaching now, but I was in charge out there at the, the Cranor Street ground, which is just terrific, really. Uh, Dick, we're coming close to the end of our time, but I thought it would be remiss of me if I didn't ask you one really... Uh, important question I think. Um, you've been exposed to so many different sports, coaching, individuals, teams, you've done research. Um, what are the common themes you've discovered as to how athletes become the best version of themselves? How do they get the best out of themselves? Ooh, yeah, um, I know one thing that I've always done and tried to do is to um, you know treat every athlete completely not completely but but differently you know as individuals because their their minds and their bodies were never the same and the interaction of their minds and their bodies were never the same as well you know um, the no no two athletes even if they were similar sorts of runners even if they were you know 1500 meter runners or or whatever they did the job differently, you know, and you found that out as, as a physiologist, you know, I, I could understand how different they were, um, uh, that they use different energy systems in different ways. Their mind worked differently in order to charge up those energy systems differently as well. And uh, racehorse owners know all about, you know, this sort of thing with, with um, the way the thoroughbreds need to be treated compared to, uh, you know, long distance uh, horses and so on. It's, it's a bit similar to that. So I suppose um, as a coach, um, you, know, you, you get to understand the importance of really, without reservation, wanting that athlete to do uh, the very, very best they can. And it, it rubs off. You, know, you can see that it rubs off on the, on the athlete, just as the athlete rubs off on me. Mm. And you become, even though I've always had other things to do with a lot of research and you know, it's what I got paid for and what I'm still paid for at the university now is every day I would think a hell of a lot about certain athletes. What am I going to say? What am I going to do a train tonight? Right now, I know that there's one particular athlete that I'm going to have a good chat there tonight about a couple of things that I think we just don't need to talk about when we go into the gym at 5.30. So I think that's probably it. You know, cricket and footy are team sports. The running is not a team sport, but, but it's my group that makes it a team sport in a certain way, that the whole group that we have together, training together, is a very, very important, important part of, the, of how an athlete is progressing. And the athletes know that I don't need, for, for my satisfaction and the reward that I get as a coach, I don't have to have every athlete representing Australia or, or winning a medal. What they do know is that I can get just as much um, satisfaction from them getting the best out of themselves and running, for example, in terms of running anyway, a, a personal best themselves. And I think that that, that personal uh, relationship that you have with the athletes, even though I've always had you know, another professional job that takes up a lot of time, is probably the one thing that I think that all coaches would say is, is uh, paramount importance, Lee. And for me, it's the one thing that stands out. Dick, uh, the last question. When you look back, um, you had three years at the crew club. Uh, what, what are your memories? Um, uh, what do you remember uh, most about that experience? I'll tell you one memory, as soon as you said that, 
It was Dion Johnson rolling out the cricket wicket. Mm -hmm. Now that's the sort of memory that comes back just straight off the cuff. Mm -hmm. um, to have a guy like um, Dion Johnson uh, around the club uh, that epitomised, you know, how you know what the club was all about. Now the guy that had come out early in the morning to get the cricket wicket right, you know, when we didn't have proper groundsmen or those sort of people looking after it, to try and get it in a position where we'd get a decent game of cricket, um, and for him to take such an interest in the club with his with his wife at that particular stage. And of course, we know his son. That sort of memory uh, is what the club was all about. But mm -hmm. lots of the players too. I'm not going to name players now, but I'm just thinking about various players that played now with the way they hit the ball, the way they feel, the way they talk, the way they, you know, I could, I could go on for hours talking about the players that they may not have thought I took a lot of interest in them. I don't know what they thought about me. It's hard to tell when I was, you know, over at Phillip Institute and running down to training and. Um, but I can tell you now that I, I thought about them a, a lot more than what they thought, that, thought I did probably. <laughs> Wonderful. On that note, uh, Dick, thank you very much for your time today. I, I'm sure that uh, most people will enjoy watching this. Um, the response we've had to the 1860 Club has been tremendous and thank you for joining and we look forward to your participation in it going forward. So thanks again, Dick. Yeah, it's uh, good to catch up with you again, Lee, and congratulations on what you're doing. And uh, obviously, no wonder you've got good responses. You'd have no hesitation. People wanted to go back and relive a few of the, the memories in those days. All the best. Mm -hmm.